Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecaster here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, October 28, 2020. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. Oh boy, we have a lot to discuss tonight. However, as complex as we can make this market and as others want to make this market, we're going to keep things rather simple. Hence, common sense market analysis. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to assess where we are on the daily chart. We're going to take a look at the same things that we've looked at over the last couple of days to see exactly what happened, what we said would happen if, what happened as a result of. We're going to look at all that stuff and then we're going to take a look back at the schematic that we've been discussing and then we're going to look at the schematic as it stands now and what the next likely scenario is going forward from a short-term perspective, an intermediate-term perspective, and a longer-term perspective. Right out of the chute, what's the first couple of things that jump off the page on the daily chart? Other than the fact that we had a woodshed day, out behind the woodshed she went. By the end of the day, the SPY was down over $11. That's over 100 points in the S&P 500. That classifies, and really when we get into how this unfolds from a technical perspective, the term that comes to mind is, she got smoked. So now let's make the assessment. What did we say? If they started getting below Monday's low, it was going to be, and I believe we use the term, good night Irene. They would go down into that zone between 330.86 and 328.73. They did go down in that zone, but at the end of the day, they closed below that zone. I'm pretty sure that's meaningful. We'll bring that into the discussion. What about the tail candle up north that we see today generated from today's activity? Is that real? Or is that a shenanigans tail? That happens to be a shenanigans tail. Where does the tail go? It goes to the gap left open from Tuesday. What do we do with that information? We can't directly do anything with that information. It's an awareness that if the market by chance was trading up in that direction, let's just say Thursday, maybe even Friday, maybe Monday or Tuesday, if the market was trading up to go fill that gap, that's an indication that you get this extra kind of half stack along with the fact that the gap is there. The shenanigans tail candle kind of tells us that as long as they're headed in that direction, the gap will be magnetic. They're going to close the gap. Again, there's nothing we can do directly with that information today. It's an awareness. We want to know about it. It's a puzzle piece. It's on the table. What else is on the daily chart? Well, the fact that the market went below the gap, closed below the gap, doesn't take away the fact that the market may find support down near the breakup candle low somewhere in that vicinity. What am I referring to? 322, 322 and a half, 323, 321 and a half, somewhere in that neighborhood would be garden variety market support under normal market conditions. Getting down there, for example, let's say on Thursday, let's say early Thursday, that would be an area that you would likely see a bunch of buyers show up. That would be a likely candidate for a bounce in that zone. Now, let's switch gears for a second and let's go back to the schematic. Remember, there's a method to the madness. So one schematic or one route had us going up. We made a high in early September. We would come down. We would make another high, whether it was a quote-unquote truncated high or a new high, either way, the market would then come down again, whether it was a new high, whether it was a truncated high, either way, the market was going to come down one way or the other. Each scenario resulted in the same thing into the future. Let's have that discussion again. Now, what happened? Well, the market made a high up into early December. The market came down in a corrective move. The market went up again, made a truncated high in this case, and now is coming down again. Now, the question is, are we going to go back up again? Is this just a pre-election sell-off? They pull the rug out temporarily, then they flip the switch, make new highs yet again. I don't think that's the case at this point. Why is that? 
Well, you have to go back to something that we discussed probably two or three times over the last, I'm going to say, couple of months. Those diehards will remember this. There was a number that if the market hit, that was going to be the end of the deal. That was going to mean no new highs. That was going to mean a confirmation that we were going lower, much lower. And let me qualify this. Let me qualify and quantify this. Nothing happens all at once, and it doesn't mean that that starts tomorrow. What it means is that the shift is on. So here's the deal. You're going to have rallies. You're going to have rip-your-face-off rallies. You're likely to have a rally starting within the next day, two, or three. But that doesn't mean we're going to make new highs. Maybe they will. Maybe I'm wrong. But here's the way I see it. The way I see it is this is going to be the beginning of the next bear phase of the market. You're going to have sharp rallies. You're going to have pie-in-the-face type stuff going on. You're going to have times for weeks on end where it looks like the market's okay. It's back to bull business once again. But that's what bear markets do. They suck you in. They tire you out. They wear you out. They leave investors and traders in despair. This is going to be a long process. There will be a ton of money to be made along the way in both directions. It's not easy to trade. Understand this. You can be right. You can be short the market. You can be correct that the market's going to come down. And you can still lose money along the way as the market whips around, makes you second-guess the trade. It has sharp rallies in your face, issues a lemon meringue pie up your nose, only to find out two days later the market's down 200 handles from where it was just 48 hours earlier. It happens all the time. There is a way in which to handle these markets, and there is a way in which not to handle these markets. We're going to handle these markets just fine. So net-net, here's what we're saying, and we're keeping this simple. We're in a sell-the-rip environment. We may get a tremendous rip, fill the gap, even go higher. The gap left open from Tuesday, maybe even higher. That will be an opportunity to sell the market from a long-term perspective. Long-term doesn't mean three weeks from now. Long-term means months. It means quarters. It means long-term. In between, you will have open the trap door type selling. You will also have counter trend, rip your face off rallies. Be ready for both. Back to business, back to the near term. Is the low or near the low of the breakup candle another buy zone? What's the low of the breakup candle? 321.64. 321.64, 321, 322 and a half. Somewhere in that neighborhood, the market will find some stability if it's down there Thursday morning. If they gap down below that and open the day below that, all bets are off something different is going on. We'll be interested to see where they close out the week by Friday. Do they snap back to close the week above the 20-week moving average, or do they close the week below the 20-week moving average? It will be a tell. That's like the tell in a poker game, being able to tell what your opponent has, what they're holding. Maybe they have a tick. Maybe they do something with their hat. Maybe they shift around in their chair. Whatever the case is, it's a tell. Where they close the week by Friday afternoon will be a tell. We don't know this is going to happen, but just from experience, I'll put it out there. It would be odd for them not to make an attempt by the end of the week to get back above the 20-period moving average. I'm not saying they'll close above it. I'm saying they'll at least give it the old college try. It's time to take a look inside the numbers. Now, on a day like today, some traders don't want to participate. Some traders don't want to take on the added risk. That's fine. Cash is a position. Now, I'll make mention of something else. Some days, we have a pretty good cadence about the market. The market's hitting numbers, it's moving, it's going from one place to another, and it's telling us what it's doing in advance in so many words or so many ways. Other days, the market is basically stuck in the mud. 
Today, the market was almost stuck in the mud. It moved, but you didn't know what it was going to do. The market went down, it gapped down, it went down. It basically was in a chop shop formation for most of the day. It had no clear direction. So here's the deal, and I'm really speaking to Inside the Numbers members. Many of you know this, some of you don't. You don't have to always be in a trade. Some days are going to be better trading days than others. If we don't have the trade in front of us, if we don't have a bona fide setup in front of us, there's nothing to do. We don't guess, we don't chase, we treat it as a business, and if we don't have it, we don't have it, and if there's nothing to put out, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to pretend that there's something going on when there's not. I'm not going to suck my traders in to a trade. I'm not going to have you thinking that the market's going to do something and I'm pretty sure it's going to do it. I'm not going to pretend that I know something when I don't. Frankly, this afternoon, there was nothing to know. The market didn't at least give me any clear indication of anything. We'll get to the chart in a moment and we'll talk more about it and you'll see what I'm discussing. And by the way, as an aside, before we move forward, what was the title of yesterday's video? Wasn't the title Bigger Move Coming? And absolutely it was. How did we know? Well, you never really know, but the market does certain things, it doesn't do other things, and you put it all together and a lot of times it tells you it's up for a bigger move. Could have been in either direction, but we spent a lot of time discussing the downside last night for a reason. The storyline is unfolding. The next thing for the market to do is pretend it's not going to be a bear market. The next thing for the market to do is get back to bull business to make everybody think and believe and believe in the next phase of the bull market. That's the market's job, and its real job is to make as many traders and investors look like fools as much of the time as possible. So, back to inside the numbers, we're talking about the zone 331 to 329, give or take. That was the same zone we discussed last night. We're just rounding numbers in the pre-market commentary. We talked about getting below Monday's low, and if they did, then the market would go back down into this zone. That's precisely what happened. We know that already. We can move it along. We want to make traders aware. This is awareness stuff. The swings this morning will be sharp, fast, and wide. If you're a participant, expect numbers to be spiked through, spike a lot. That happens. You have to be aware that a normal stop is not necessarily a normal stop on a day like today. The market is normal, let's say 80-85% of the time, right? It's the 80-20 rule. On the other 20% of the time, 15-20% of the time, it's not normal. Not normal could be a variety of different things. You have a flash crash. That's not normal. The market crashes for two weeks on end or three weeks on end. That's not normal, but we know it happens so we can deal with it while it's happening. Then the market normalizes. It gets back to normal, and guess what? It trades normal. But while it's not normal, it's not necessarily easy to trade. We have to know that. That's an awareness. 9.33, they have yet to get into the zone, they will. Obviously, some traders are trading it short into the zone. Some traders are looking for a buying opportunity in the zone. 9.38, keep in mind we have the next big fat round number on the docket too, 3.30, it's right in the zone. When they do make an attempt, they come up short, they spike it through, we don't know which one, when it's going to happen. I like to say that because it's an awareness. I like to remind traders of the possibilities. Trading is not a one-dimensional thing. Moving right along. Adding insult to injury, my charts got screwed early in the day with all that volume. For whatever reason, my platform provider, in this case is TradeStation, just wasn't feeding me the data fast enough. Maybe it was my internet connection, but I doubt it. I have fiber to the door. There was nothing wrong with my internet connection. Moving right along. Here's another one, 945. No chasing. This is how Trick and Company will suck traders into the market. Maybe they take off. We don't know. Chasing is a recipe for a loss the majority of the time. That was at 945. Let's go to the chart. Here's a five-minute chart. We know the routine. Right of the vertical, today's activity. So here's your gap down. Here's 945. 
So I'm saying that as they're rising, I know what's going to happen. I know the writing's on the wall. It's just a matter of where exactly they're going to turn around and hand everybody a big fat shit burger. It was about five minutes later, the market turned around, never looked back. The elephant in the room was a BBBY trade. They hit the number, but they didn't really fill the number. I think you had to be in front of the number to get filled on that trade. We'll get to those later. Moving right along. Now, here's what I'm going to do from this point forward. I'm going to scroll up. Those of you interested what the notes say, and I think you should read them, there's learnable stuff in here. Those of you interested will pause the video, you'll read the notes, and go back to the charts to see what happened. Those of you who aren't interested will just blow right past it. But here's the deal. The market was in a chop shop formation most of the day. You want to pay attention to some of the numbers, but for the most part, they didn't really do anything material all day long after the morning session. However, there is one interesting number that was on the board, and here you'll see it in the 1245 post. As they're falling, we have to look for additional support areas, right? So I have to put something up on the board. What is it? The next spots are around, so I put two up on the board because I'm going to lunch, I'm at lunch. I don't want to post for another half an hour or so. I don't know what happens if they fall through the floor. I have to put something up on the board, so I put two numbers up. The next one was 326, and then I put 323.50 was down in the range of that breakup candle low in that vicinity. Okay, fair enough. Now you know where that came from. But 326 was no joke. That was a real number. I didn't just throw it up on the wall, see if it stuck. It was a real number. Well, look at this. They didn't give us a chance to do anything with that number, but guess what? Into the end of the day, what's the low? How about 326.13? No accidents. No coincidences. Know thy numbers. Moving right along. And this will take us into the end of the day. You can read the notes for yourself. What we'll do now is do the good, the bad, and the ugly thing. Take a look at the stocks on the move list. You never know what happened with these stocks on a day like today when everything was getting thrown out with the bathwater. We had Love, Akamai, and BBBY. We'll take a look at the charts and then we'll get back to the indices. How about Southwest Airlines? Love, 37.89 was the number on the board bright and early. That was essentially the number. They spiked below it by a little bit, popped back above it. It was the number. It's a base hit. What happens to hitters that string together a career of base hits? They go into the Hall of Fame. How about Akamai? They didn't do the deal because in the first candle of the day, using this 15-minute chart, it doesn't matter either way. They came too close and had a nice rip away from that level. The low was 98.35 against 98.26. Had a tremendous bounce away. That is, in fact, the trade. So anything after that is a non-event because it becomes a no trade. But here's to the point that number's important. Look at them beat around that number. It's a chop shop formation all afternoon long like the market. But what happens at the end of the day? What's the high here? 98.24. What's the high in this candle? 98.27. What's my number? Right in the middle, 98.26. Accident? Coincidence? I don't think so. How about BBBY, Bed Bath & Beyond? This one was worth dozens of emails. Number on the board, $20.55. Low of day, $20.55. No fill. You had to be in front to get a fill. Let me answer the question for some traders that had questions on BBBY. So there's a spread on every trade, a bid and a ask. So right now, even though the market's closed, you can see a bid and an ask at the top of the screen. The bid price is 2131, the ask is 2140. Every trade, every stock has a bid and an ask all the time. You can buy on the ask, sell on the bid. So if the bid is $20.55, but the ask at the time happens to be $20.57, 58 59 cents, whatever it is, and they never hit $20.55 on the ask. You may never get filled. You won't get filled. In between, if they come close, some traders will get a fill, some won't. What is the determining factor to who gets a fill and who doesn't? And without a shadow of a doubt, the answer is your broker. Some brokers are just flat out better than others. One of the two main reasons that I use TradeStation, in fact, the only two reasons I use TradeStation is 
Number one, the executions. And number two, the charts. I like the charts. But I could get used to charts elsewhere. They're all pretty much the same. I'm sure other platform providers have good executions as well. I've been using these guys, these folks, a long time. I'm good with it. But that's how a bid and an ask scenario works. In this case, they hit the number, they took off like a bat out of hell on a rocket ride, making a high of 22.18 just minutes later. There were some traders that did get filled, but I know they got filled at a higher number because I know the way the market works. What they did was front run my number. Before we move on, let's have a discussion about the gap. 328.73, you can see the market center around that gap all day from the point in which it hit the gap. So we know that was important. Now they could have went either way into the close. Into the end of the day, anything goes. They can have a rally, they can hit them hard. They decided to hit them down, closing below the gap. That's another bearish signal. However, they're going to have a rip your face off rally, whether it comes at some point on Thursday, Friday or Monday, or maybe Tuesday after the election, maybe Wednesday, we don't know. But there will be a rip your face off rally. If we don't get one soon, there will be a lot lower prices first. But step one is they didn't close above the gap. So we know that it's a puzzle piece. It's on the table. The number in question, the gap was 328.73. Here's something that's taught in the course. And here's a snippet of what's taught in the course, lazy e-mini trader. How about market symmetry? How about time is on your side? We have a gap down and a breakdown candle. First candle of the day. This is the hourly chart. Then the market puts in a bearish, wedgish, flaggish kind of pattern and breaks down at the end of the day. Guess what? On time. You have market symmetry. You have time is on your side. You start to get a full stack. Now, it also doesn't look like 330.86 was any important at all. However, there was this one little flash up to that point. You find it even on a one minute chart. I didn't see the market do it. So here's the deal. The high in this candle was 330.95, just a few pennies over that number. What's the significance of that number? Let's go get a refresher. The number is in the vicinity of the high of this breakdown candle. The high is 331.20. My number is slightly below that for other reasons. When you see a spike like that to a place and then a immediate reversal, that's the market telling you that that place that the market spiked up to in that candle is important. There's no other reason to do that. All I'm doing is adding in common sense stuff. So we'll file that place away, that general zone around 331. We'll file that away for later. I'm telling you that number's important. What about Camp IWM? Wasn't the writing on the wall? Didn't they just close below the 20 period moving average? Isn't that bearish? Then they gapped below my line here, so that line was nonsense. And then they did one of those things where they come up short. We just talked about it before. They do this stuff all the time. Here's a gap, 152.85. What was the low of day today? Low of day was 153.05 missing the gap by 20 cents. Did they have an opportunity to fill the gap? Absolutely. They chose not to. Why? Well, it's designed by Trick Trap Fool and Frustrate Crew. What's their job? We know their job is to frustrate, is to trick, is to take as many traders and investors out behind the woodshed as they can. Either way, they'll fill the gap. The IWM, which is my favorite market leading indicator, was down just short of 3%. The SPY was down just over 3%, split the difference. They're both down about 3%. The IWM is also slightly different position than the SPY. For example, we're hovering right above this gap. Now the SPY is headed toward a weekly chart, breakup candle low, and guess what? If you compare, and we talked about this one, if you compare the two weekly charts, look where we are as it relates to the IWM weekly chart breakup candle low. Now we're below it. Filling the gap, we're gonna fill the gap. It depends on where we close this week. Are we gonna close above all these moving averages but below this breakup candle low? What's that gonna tell us? Above or below the gap? It's gonna be a very interesting, interesting close come Friday. What about the folks down at the transportation department? They had a waterfall decline. They got smoked. 
Look where we've went, look where they've went in just a matter of two days. First, they close just below the 20 period moving average. Then they get to the gap or just short of the gap and here basically a 500 point down day over 4%. This is a woodshed day. However, what's interesting, and we're going to circle back to the SPY, I forgot to discuss volume. Interestingly enough, that's not capitulation volume. What does that tell us? It tells us there could be more downside. It tells us that was not, even though we finished on the low, but not with exhaustion volume, it's unlikely that was an exhaustion move. It's unlikely this was the end of a move. How do you know when it's an exhaustion move? Take the course, Lazy E-Mini Trader. We have a discussion about that. How about the volume in the SPY? Now, it was better than the 90-day average volume. That's about 74 million shares, but it's not tremendous volume. It's nice volume. It's good volume. It shows institutional participation volume for sure, but it's not an ending move. It's not capitulation volume, nothing like that. It shows that it was a serious decline, but we already knew that. What about the folks out in Silicon Valley? Can you say Smokey and the Bandit? They got smoked three and a half percent, 10 bucks in the queues coming into the 100 period moving average. Do they come up short of the 100 and turn around and go back up in the other direction? Or do they hit the 100, spike through the 100, come down to a double bottom zone down here? Yeah, that's more like the ticket. 265 would be a juicy number for the queues. Where do you come up with 265 without really doing anything? How do you come up with 265 just using the visual on the chart? Common sense stuff. Here's what I'll say. This is just stuff 101. So the market runs up to this zone. It's not exactly 265, but it's close. You'll get the point in a moment. Runs up to this zone, has a bit of a stutter step, right? And then it finally gets through. So we know that this general area up here is important because they didn't just blow through there. They had a stutter step. So that's important. So that's also somewhat of a breakout area. That's fine. They have a huge rally. They come back down to test what? The former breakout area, fill the gap. We know all that stuff. That's right here. Now we're starting to get interested. We're starting to get closer to having something to discuss. What's that low over here? 264.63. Why is that important? That's where the market did its back test. That's where it came down to. It ran the test and it took off to the upside. That was the last and the most final price lower before it had a tremendous rally after the breakout. Market breaks out, runs a test. We had the same discussion last night on a different chart, didn't we? Why? Because all charts act and react the same way. How many times do I have to say it? You want to learn more about how that all works and how they act and react? Take the course, Lazy E-Mini Trader. It's not a shameless plug. There's absolutely a gold mine of information in there. All right, back to this chart, the cues. So now I'm zeroing in on that back test, right? All of a sudden, we have another situation where the market came down. It basically back tested the same general zone and took off again to the upside. All right. So you know my mind is a dangerous place to be. So here's the way I did it. Here's the way I do it. I do this all the time. This is important. This is important. I think this is more important because of the running a test, right? The back test. And then we had another situation here where they had another back test. Now we're coming into a what? A breakup candle low. All of a sudden, where is the breakup candle low? Well, let's get a number. The breakup candle low is 264.30. I'm just using a round number, 265. It's not magic. It's not really mathematics in this case. I hang my hat on the thing that the market does the majority of the time, especially, especially after it's down this many days in a row, this much, coming into a breakup candle low, it's more likely than not that you're going to get some kind of chart support around 265. 264, 264 and a half, 265 and a quarter, something in that zone. How about the financials? How about filling a gap? There's a gap down here. The gap is officially at 2349. The low today was 2347 in the XLF. They've given up all the moving averages. We talked about that yesterday. They've given up now 
This breakup candle low, the low is 23.73. They closed below that today. That's bearish. 23 and a quarter is still some support, but this is bearish. We've talked before at length about how the longer term chart of the financials, the XLF in this case, looks really, really bad. It looks more like a war zone than anything else. And Smash Mouth had the same woodshed day that everybody else had, and just in one fell swoop, gives up the 50 period moving average and didn't even threaten to get back and close above it during the day. There's a gap down about 169 and a quarter if they continue down. If they have a snapback, they'll try and get over the 50 period moving average or at least back to it around 176. If I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you, without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.